If you'll take your Bibles and open to the book of Joshua this morning, Joshua chapter 5. We'll be talking this morning about one of the greatest stories in the Bible, one that we like to hear about, um, a story of faith, a story of God's great power, that's the story of Jericho. And, uh, you know, if you were going to church as a little kid, you probably knew the story of Jericho. Now think about this a little bit. The Israelites had just wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. If they needed food, God sent manna down from heaven for them. When they needed um, water, God brought it out of a rock. Uh, The Bible says that their shoes didn't wear out for 40 years and their clothes didn't wear out for 40 years. And... um, So it was a great time, but something struck me as I was reading through this this passage of Scripture in chapter 5, and uh, starting in verse 13. Now Joshua, Joshua has become the leader now, Moses has died, and so now Joshua is the leader of the Israelites, had just gone through the Red Sea, and God had told them, you can take this land, we're going to give this land to you. But they crossed the, I'm sorry, not the Red Sea, the Jordan River. They'd crossed the Jordan River into Canaan, into the promised land. And God said, it's yours, you can take it. But there was a problem. It was occupied. And so they came in there, and they came to Jericho. Verse 13 in chapter 5. It says, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. Now that's a strange answer. I just described to you how God had been with them through these 40 years. He was in the pillar of fire at night, the pillar of cloud by day. He was in the tabernacle. He was with Moses on Mount Sinai. And Joshua asked this question, are you for us or are you for our enemies? He says, neither. He says, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come now. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. What does that mean? Have you ever wondered, how do, I, how do I get God on my side? How do I get the Lord on my side? You know, obviously later on, we, we know that the Lord was on their side. In fact, it, it, it says several times that the Lord was fighting for Israel. If we look at the uh, case a few chapters later when Israel was having this great battle, and it says that God stopped the sun, He stopped the earth from turning. For a whole day. In Joshua chapter 10 it says, So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As is written in the book of Jasher, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There's never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. So the question is, if the Lord is neither for you or against you, how do you get him on your side? I think here's the answer to that question. You don't. You get on the Lord's side. You get on the Lord's side. Let's look at the life of Joshua. I think there's some things that we can learn from the life of Joshua that how did he get, how did he place himself on the Lord's side? What did he do? And what are some things that we can learn from Joshua that can help us in our own life to do that as well? I think number one, Joshua was a willing worker. He was a willing worker. You know, he was by Moses' side all during their travel, all during their journey. In Exodus 24, it says, Then Moses set out with Joshua his aid, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. Joshua was there when Moses was... um, Receiving the law from God. He was always a willing worker. He was with Moses from the beginning. So one of the ways to get on the Lord's side, I believe, is to become a servant. In fact, even Jesus himself said, the greatest among you will be your servant. 
Now, Jesus had a direct connection with the Father, right? He was pretty close. I, th I think we could say that he was on God's side, right? Well, look at what he says in Matthew 20. He says, your attitude must be like my own. For I, the Messiah, did not come to be served, but to serve. But to serve. So Joshua was a servant. So how are you doing in that department this morning? When you're called upon to help someone, to help out in the church or whatever it may be, are you willing? Are you a willing helper or can you always find an excuse? Just ask him. Number two, Joshua didn't cave into peer pressure. Many years earlier, Joshua was one of the 12 spies that went into the land of Canaan to check it out. Only he and Caleb believed they could take the land. The other 10 came back and they, they convinced the whole camp that there was just no way that they could go in and take this land. We find it in Numbers chapter 14 where it says, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. This was after the others had convinced these two million people or so to totally rebel and totally go against them, totally go against Moses. In fact, they were threatening to stone them. But Joshua and Caleb stood their ground. And they said, no, we can do it because God says we can do it. He knew what was right. and He was willing to stand for what was right. How are you doing in that area? When the world around you is going crazy and falling into sin, are you able to stand? Are you able to stand and say, this is what I believe, and I don't compromise what I believe? I stand on this solid rock. I do not compromise what I believe. Proverbs says, The wicked man flees though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. So do you stand for what you believe? Do you know what you believe? Do you, or are you easily swayed by popular opinion? I think the important thing is to know what is in this word, to know what you stand on. And Joshua knew that. He wasn't swayed by popular opinion. You know, our world is increasingly influenced by all kinds of lies, by all kinds of political correctness or whatever you want to call it. They're trying to control our conversation. That's peer pressure on a national level. What about on a personal level? When you know you're standing on the right side of truth, are you bold enough to speak out and make a stand? Joshua never wavered. Through his whole life, he never wavered on where he stood. In fact, there was one time where Joshua stood up and said, you choose, you all, all of you choose who you're going to serve this day. But he said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's standing. That's making a bold statement. And that was Joshua. I think the third thing is that Joshua followed God wholeheartedly. Numbers 32, and again, this was 40 years earlier. God said, Because you have not followed me wholeheartedly, not one of the men 20 years old or more who came up out of Egypt will see the land I promised, an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not one except Caleb and Joshua, for they followed me wholeheartedly. For they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. You know, God wants all of you, not just an hour on Sunday morning. He wants it all, your time, your money, your heart. Could you be convicted on Thursday morning that you're a Christian? Or is it just a Sunday morning thing for you? See, following God wholeheartedly means being a Christian every day, being sold out to God's teaching, being sold out to, to this Word and what this Word says. It means believing the Bible from cover to cover. When the Bible says that God created everything, 
It means believing that, just like the Bible says, that God created everything in six days. It means believing that there was once a great flood that covered the whole earth, over the mountains even. You know, there's so much pressure in our world today to believe that the earth is billions of years old and that anyone who doesn't believe that is looked on as simple and foolish and is mocked openly. But following God is standing on that anyway because that's what God's Word says. Following God wholeheartedly is believing that Jesus came, born of a virgin, crucified on a cross, gave His life for us to redeem a lost and dying world back to God. Following God wholeheartedly is believing that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Because that's what he said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except my me. It's not, it's not Jesus and these ten other things. It's Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's wholeheartedly. So how are you doing in that area this morning? Another thing, number four, Joshua was filled with the spirit of wisdom. It says that in Deuteronomy 34. It says, Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him, so the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. The spirit of wisdom. How do you, how do you get wisdom? Everybody wants to be wise, right? Anybody, anybody here that doesn't want to be wise? Oh, okay. You all want to be wise, right? Okay. How do you get wisdom? How do you get wisdom? Well, Proverbs or Psalms tells us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. Now, what is the fear of the Lord? Well, it's a, it's a deep respect for God. It's, it's, um, it's starting with God. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Of wisdom. We have to start there. You know, if you want to understand our world, you have to understand that it starts with an understanding of who God is. I love the story about the, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it makes a great story about the atheist that sued that um, sued the government because they said he said. Uh, you know, we've got all these other holidays out there. You know, you've got the Christians have their holidays, the Jews have their holidays. There's even, I think tomorrow's what, Columbus Day? Is that what's tomorrow? Martin Luther King Day. Okay, we've got Martin Luther King Day tomorrow. There's all kinds of holidays out there, but atheists don't have a holiday. So we need a holiday for atheists. So the judge says, well, you've already got one. It's April 1st. Because the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. April Fool's Day is your holiday, because that's what the Bible says. See, the fool starts with a worldview that says there is no God. So then they have to come up with answers to hard questions like, well, where did we come from? How did we get here? And so they come up with the theory of evolution that, you know, you started with some pond scum somewhere and grew into a tadpole and a fish. I don't know how it all goes, but you wind up being a monkey and now you're a human being. Man, that takes a lot of faith to believe that. I believe that God created me. Amen. And then they look about around our world and they ask the question, what is right and what is wrong? There is no moral code, so we will just make one up. And we'll decide it's okay to kill unborn babies. Because it pleases me. There's no moral code in marriage between a man and a woman. Why not between two men and two women? Or a woman and a dog? Or whatever we wanted to make it to be. Because there's no moral code. Because we don't start with God. We have to start with God. Or we look around the world and we see that the weather changes. The weather patterns change. And we're like... Well, it can't be a God that's controlling that. It's got to be your SUV that's doing that. And we call it climate change. 
So you can only have godly wisdom when you start with God. When you start with a biblical worldview. When you look at the world through the filter of the Bible, the filter of God's Word. See, when you do that, when you start with a biblical worldview, then it becomes obvious that killing babies in the womb is wrong, that gay marriage is not natural, that God created everything, that Satan corrupted it, that Jesus came to redeem it by his blood shed on the cross, that he ascended into heaven and that he is returning again. It all makes sense when you start with a biblical world, with a view of God. But if you don't start with that, there is no wisdom. As the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But Joshua had that. He had that godly world view that gave him that spirit of wisdom. Here's a, the fifth thing. Joshua taught all of God's word. He taught all of God's word. Joshua 8, 34 says, Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. Notice it says blessings and curses, not just what people wanted to hear. The book of the law that he would have had would have been what Moses wrote, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's what he would have had. And he read that. And he taught that to the people. He read all the books of the law, it says. You see, in the Bible, there's some really good stuff. There's some really great stuff. There's some really serious stuff, too, in there. The Bible says there's, there's blessings in here and there's curses in here. Joshua was one that was willing to stand up and speak the truth no matter what it was. He didn't twist God's word to make it say what he wanted it to say. And then finally, the sixth thing, Joshua was willing to follow orders. Now, put yourself in Joshua's place. They'd just crossed the Jordan River. He had this vast army that was camped out on the banks of the Jordan River. He could look out at the Israelites, and as far as he could see this way, there were tents. As far as he could see this way, there were the tents of the Israelites. He had this vast army that he was the commander of. He was the leader. And he looks to the edge of the camp and he sees a man standing there with his sword drawn. Hmm. Now nobody draws their sword unless Joshua tells them to. So he goes up to the man and he says, what are you doing here? Who are you? What are you doing here? And the man says, he says, are you for us or against us? He said, neither. He said, I'm the commander of the Lord's army. He's the general of the Lord's army. So what does he say, tell him? He says, Joshua, take off your shoes because the place you're standing is holy ground. I think only one other time in the Bible that happened. And that was when Moses met God at the burning bush. And here we have the same thing happening to Joshua. Why? Why did he tell him to take off of his shoes? I believe it's because he was telling him that, Joshua, you're not in command here. I am. I am. Who was this man that Joshua saw there? I believe it was Jesus Christ himself. I believe it was Jesus Christ himself that came. Pre-incarnate Jesus Christ that came and was standing there and says, you're not the commander, I'm the commander, take off your shoes. Anybody going into battle knows you've got to have some shoes. You've got to have something on your feet. But he said, take off your shoes. You know, you all do that when you come into your house. I, I mean, I hear that from Goldie, right? Sometimes she, I come in the house and she says, take off, your, take off your shoes. Don't go on my carpet with those shoes on. She's the commander of our house, just, just so you know. She's in charge, right? Well, I think that's kind of what was going on here. Take off your shoes. You're not leading this army. I am. You don't give the orders. I do. Let's read a few verses in chapter 6. 
It says, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. So this city, and these, these city walls were 30 feet high. Uh, it was like a double wall, and there was houses building between the wall, and it was, it was a mighty fortress. Now, it wasn't a huge city. They say it was about seven acres. So that's a little bit bigger than a lot of our church here. So it wasn't a huge city, but because they saw the Israelites coming, everyone in, went inside the city, they locked the doors and closed them. So that was, a, that was the scenario that was going on. And the Lord had something very strange to tell them. It says, then the Lord said to Joshua in verse 2, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hand, along with its kings and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Okay, let's, let's stop there. What a strange thing to tell them. What a strange way to overtake a city. Walk around the city every day for seven days. Then on the seventh day, walk around it seven times. I mean, you know, that's not how you fight a battle. That's not how it's normally done. I can imagine as they walked around that city, probably by the third or fourth day, the people on the wall up there were mocking them. What are you doing walking around this city? I imagine by the fifth or sixth day, the people behind Joshua were probably mocking him, saying, why are we doing this? Why are we walking around this city every day? This is crazy. You don't fight a battle that way. But notice that Joshua did it anyway. He was obedient to what God told him to do. And we know what happened. The walls fell down. They went in. They annihilated the city. Now, I want to address something here this morning. Uh, I've heard people argue, well, you know... <laughs> That God of the Bible is such a cruel God. Or the Bible contradicts itself so it can't be true because the New Testament talks about this God of love and everything. Then we go in the Old Testament and we see where he tells him to go in and uh, in this case, they went into Jericho and they totally killed everybody, including animals. If you go back down to verse 21, uh, it says they devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it. Men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. That's one of those things in the Bible that, you know, it might be kind of nice to just kind of skip over and not talk about some of those things. But Why did God tell them to do that? What was the purpose of that? Well, I want to share with you some things that the Bible says and what some modern, modern archaeologists have found. You know, God told Moses back in Deuteronomy 9, verse 5, he says, and this was talking about them going into the land of Canaan. He said, it is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going in to take possession of their land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God was judging the people living in Canaan one way or another. He just chose to use the Israelites to do that. He was judging them for their wickedness. The, wick the cities of Canaan were extremely wicked. They worshipped Baal. They practiced child sacrifice. According to Halley's Bible Handbook, in some archaeological excavations that they've done in Jericho and some of the other cities around that area, they found human remains built into the walls of the city. They found human remains into the walls of the houses. It's believed that they had this practice when they would build a house, they would sacrifice a child and they would 
put the child's remains in a jar and put it into the wall of the house for good luck. That's who those people were. That's why God ordered the Israelites to go in and destroy them. Because their wickedness had gotten to the point that he couldn't take it anymore. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah and others. God repeatedly told the Israelites, do not compromise with them. Do not intermarry with them. Do not worship their idols. You must completely destroy them. He was using the nation of Israel to judge the the wicked nations of Canaan. Now God is patient. God is long-suffering. But when a nation reaches a certain point, God is also the judge and the jury. He'll bring judgment on wicked people. Will that happen to America? I believe it will if we don't turn back to God. You know, last year we talked some about the findings of Planned Parenthood and how they were selling baby parts and all this kind of stuff. And there was a a big deal about uh, we need to defund Planned Parenthood. Well, just a couple weeks ago in the new budget that the Congress passed, they fully funded $500 million to Planned Parenthood. Republicans and Democrats, okay? Both sides. Um. When we have judges that redefine the definition of marriage, are we more like Israel or the Canaanites? I don't know how long God's patience will last with us. But there will come a time, there will come a time when we will have to pay for that. But Joshua never wavered. Joshua always obeyed what God wanted him to do. Even when it didn't make sense, even when it went totally against the grain of everybody around him. What did Jesus say in John 14, 23? Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. So how are you doing? Is God on your side this morning? The better question, are you on God's side this morning? Are you on God's side? That's how you get on God's side. God never changes. God's always there. He's always the same. He never changes. And <laughs> I love these Facebook things, right, that they put out, you know, these little memes. Share this post, and, you know, God will do this for you today. And I must be really bad. I never share them. <laughs> but uh, that's not how it works. And then, then there was one that was like, you know, this isn't how it works. God isn't a genie, you know. But getting on God's side, doing the right things will bring great blessing in your life. Next week we're going to talk some about, about uh, you know, how do you bring that blessing in your life? How do you, how do you, Dwell in the area of the blessings of this book and not the curses of this book. Let's talk about that next week, shall we? Um, So are you a willing worker? Do you stand up to peer pressure? Are you following God wholeheartedly? Are you filled with the spirit of wisdom this morning? Are you teaching what you know to others? And are you willing to obey orders? Don't expect God to bring down the walls for you unless you're willing to be on his team. Unless you're willing to be on his team.